On the night of the 30th of June to the 1st of July, 1839, 53 recently captured Africans of Mende origin revolted against their jailers on the Spanish schooner La Amistad. Led by Senga P.A., later known as Joseph Sinke, they managed to take over the ship. This event will have important implications for the abolition of slavery in the U.S. American abolitionists used this event as a way of exposing the evils of slavery and creating strong opposition to the practice. It all began in February 1839 on the African coast of what is now Sierra Leone, at the time a British colony. With the complicity of the local King Siaka, people were captured by Pedro Blanco's men and taken to Lomboco, a slave factory under his control. Pedro Blanco was a notorious Spanish slave trader based on the coast of Sierra Leone between 1822 and 1838, where he played a major role in the development of the slave trade in this region. In 1839, its network supplied Cuba, the United States, and Brazil with slaves for the plantations. These Africans are exported for sale in the Spanish colony of Cuba, along with 500 others on the Tacora, a Portuguese slave ship. The boat landed in Havana two months later in mid-June 1839. At that time, several countries, including the United States and the Great Britain, had abolished the importation of enslaved persons, but it continued illegally and Havana was an important slave trading hub. The slaves who survived the journey were disembarked at night, undressed and herded into barracks. Disease, starvation and beatings were commonplace. About 10 days later, 49 adult men are taken aboard the schooner La Amistad, commanded by Captain Raymond Ferrer, disguised as sailors. Jose Ruiz bought them from the captain of the Tacora. Another man, Pedro Montes, acquired three girls and a boy, the slave merchants want to go to Puerto Principe to sell them to the owners of the sugar plantations, which were flourishing at the time. La Amistad left Havana on June 28, 1839, with some general cargo and the 53 African captives, under the cover of nightfall, in order to avoid the British anti-slavery patrols. A new journey begins, during the captives experienced harsh treatment, humiliation, threats, and lack of fresh water. La Amistad had no slave quarters, so half the captives were placed in the main hold and the other half on deck. During the night of the 30th of June to the 1st of July, one of them, Sangba P.A., managed to free himself and help the others to do the same. They armed themselves with what they could find, killed the ship's cook, killed the ship's captain, Ramon Ferrer, and took possession of La Amistad. Two other crew members jumped into the water in a canoe to escape. Two Africans also die in the fighting. After negotiations between the rebels, Ruiz and Montes are spared in order to pilot the ship back to their homeland. Instead of turning the ship eastward, the Spaniards repeatedly misled the Africans about the direction of the ship and secretly changed course at night. They wander between the Caribbean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean for six weeks in the hope of encountering a ship that could free them. The lack of fresh water was problematic and several died from dysentery and dehydration. After sailing through the Bahamas, where the Amistad paused on various small islands, it sailed up the coast of the United States. They finally landed near New York on Long Island. There they were captured by an American ship, the Washington, at the end of August 1839. Ruiz and Montes were freed, while the surviving Africans were arrested and imprisoned on charges of murder in New Haven, Connecticut. The Amistad rebels attracted a great amount of popular interest. As soon as they arrived in the United States, they were the subject of numerous articles in newspapers such as the New York Sun and the New London Gazette. Thousands of spectators flocked to get a glimpse of the alleged pirate ship and its fearsome black crew. And their jailers are undoubtedly the ones who have benefited the most from it by monetizing the visits of the curious like in a real human zoo while waiting for a trial to decide their fate. Despite the fact that the murder charges were dismissed, the plantation owners, government of Spain and captain of the Washington, each claimed rights to the Africans or compensation. Ruiz and Montes wanted their so-called property back, while the Spanish and U.S. governments demanded that the Africans be returned to Cuba, where death certainly awaited them. The abolitionist movement seized on the controversy and encouraged public sympathy for the captives. They hired Roger S. Baldwin, a lawyer from New Haven, plus two New York attorneys, Seth Staples and Theodore Sedgwick, to serve as legal representatives for the Africans. Finally, 
they added Josiah Gibbs Sr., a linguist, to help determine what language most of the Africans spoke. To learn their language, he goes to prison and shows them piles of coins. Using this technique, he was able to count to ten. Gibbs then walked around the ports of New Haven and New York, counting from one to ten in the words he had just learned. In October 1839, two British sailors, James Covey and Charles Pratt, recognized the words and came to meet Gibbs telling him that this language was Mende. Covey was hired as a translator for the Africans, allowing them to tell their story in court and to defend themselves. Surprisingly, the judge ruled that the Africans were victims of kidnapping and had the right to escape in any way possible. Dissatisfied with the decision, the U.S. government and the Spaniards appealed the results to the Supreme Court, arguing that anti-piracy agreements with Spain compelled the U.S. to return the Africans to Cuba. This time, the mutineers were defended by former President John Quincy Adams, who was 73 years old, member of the House of Representatives, and a strong anti-slavery voice. In February 1841, the court confirmed the previous judgment, stating that they were free men and ordered the immediate release of the Amistad Africans. In May 1841, supported by the abolitionists, they toured in public, taking advantage of their history and newfound fame to make money. Sinke, their leader, was the main star. Some artists even drew his portrait. Still with the help of the abolitionists, the surviving captives departed from New York Harbor for Sierra Leone on the 25th of November, 1841. Sailing on the gentlemen, they were accompanied by James Covey. They arrived safely in Freetown in January, 1842, and were welcomed by William Ferguson, the British governor of Sierra Leone. Only 35 of them returned to their homeland, the others died at sea or in prison awaiting trial. This unprecedented media impact undoubtedly had a strong influence on the development of abolitionist ideas and methods. Moreover, it was a painting by Jocelyn depicting Sinke that prompted Madison Washington, along with 18 other slaves, to take control of Loch Creole, which was transporting them, in order to free the 130 African prisoners. The combination of the Amistad and Loch Creole rebellions had a major impact on the fight against slavery. A memorial was dedicated on the 18th of September, 1992 in New Haven, Connecticut. The Amistad Memorial is a bronze sculpture by Ed Hamilton, located on the site where the captives were held during their trial. The statue depicts Senga P.A. and tells the story through its different sides. One side show him in his homeland, another in court during his trials, and the third side after he has won his freedom. At the top of the sculpture, only visible from the upper floors of City Hall, we can see a face and hands in water.